All right, welcome back to another PCBH Corner. And this is one that uh, I have been wanting to do for a while, and I know you have as well. Um, to give a little kind of overview and intro into this video. So I, I don't think it would be a shock for our viewers to know that you know, we're big contextual people. What? <laughs> we're, what? We're, we're, we're not really big into you know uh, symptoms and pathologies and disorders, diagnosing and then that informing treatment. We're more in, interested in the human, what their context is, and then working with them on coming up with a game plan that's gonna move them towards their values and the, what's important that's to well them. That's well said. Thanks, thank you, I appreciate that. So the, the question that we often get asked though is like, you know, well, how do, how do you formulate that? Because usually the thing for mm. mental health providers that we formulate is based off maybe like the DSM-5. You know, these are right. symptoms and diagnosis that then going to implement this treatment plan. It's very, it's a very clear route. It's, it's a like very clear route. Patient comes in, you um, interview them, do a diagnostic interview, find out what the diagnosis is from the DSM, and then that helps you uh, inform your treatment plan. You know, I actually had one of our interns, uh, Brenna, who was uh, asked a great question. She was like, I agree, I agree with you. She's like, but what's, what else are we gonna do? Like, what, what else is gonna be the, the way? Like, like what replaces, like, what the What steps? replaces a DSM-5, you know, okay. in a sense, really, to be the starting off point, to be our grounding point. And so uh, Bridget, and I, it was for what, like a presentation or something that we were doing was really, because we're always trying to like think, how do we iterate the contextual interview? How do we make it more understandable and digestible for people to kind of look at what you're And then I read the, I think it was the peak Yes, the or peak. how experts become experts. It was or? it was peak because they talked it's about peak. mental representations and the other book that you just recommended that I'm almost done with. Uh, what is it? Smarter, better, faster. Yeah, smarter, better, faster. That also talks about the importance of me mental representation. Yes, they do talk about, it. and and that's what happened was because uh, I have in my journal entry, which was really cool to go back and see yeah, like a year yeah. later. I just sat there and said what would be the mental representations needed to be able to execute the role of a BHC? So I just started jotting them all down. And let's pause, that. what a beautiful question, right? And like even for people maybe even to pause the video right now to try to really see where your mind goes with that question. And what was it again? What would be the mental representations yep. that would be needed to be uh, effective, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, whatever, you know, I always think about it, like a compassionate, contextual BHC, like what would be the mental representations that would be needed? And do we have a quick, easy definition of mental representations? Oh man, so I would just say like, uh, 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 I always love giving that chess metaphor, but I don't know if that actually would make uh, sense to do real quick. I'll do it real quick okay. that, you know, they did a study that they looked at, you know, people obviously think like these grandmasters in chess, like Magnus Carlsen, like that he has this unbelievable uh, memory and right. this unbelievable sense of like, he's like just, cognitive power. He's just super, super intelligent. And that probably, probably is, is true. That probably is true. So what they did, they did a study where they took novice chess players and they compared them against master grandmasters chess players. And what they wanted to do or see was like how incredible these people's memories were. So what they did was they, they had two chess boards. The first chess board was uh, laid out of pieces and it made sense, right? It had logic, it had strategy. strategy that was influenced by it. Both groups then, novice, masters, they looked at the board, I think it was for like 10 seconds or something like that, short amount of time. Then they were asked to recreate the board. Novice, couldn't do it really at all. Grandmasters, boom. Like no basically problem. accurate to the core. Second board that they did was no strategy, completely random. It didn't make sense. Didn't it make sense. Like you couldn't what? even have those pieces there. Did the same scenario, look at it for 10 seconds. Both groups then couldn't put it back together. And so what they came to was that these master chess players just had a, such an understanding and a mental representation of what the game was supposed to be that they were able to put these things back together. When, they could see patterns. Exactly, when their brain, when they looked at that board for 10 seconds, mm. the, the grandmasters, they saw the myriad strategies, which you would imagine was from years and years and years of practice of like, okay, if this is this combination, it mm -hmm. means this. If it's that combination, it means that. Now this is where my metaphor breaks down because I don't know enough about chess to use any more of a description. But for, She's learning. But She's for learning. us, for mental representations, so when a patient says one thing, that's gonna trigger a cascade yes. of 
of mental representations of, oh, okay, this kind of sounds like adverse child experiences. This, these words sequenced together, this response in this way tells me that there's something more going on by this pithy response or by, you know, somebody looking away, all the nonverbals. And, and, and as a clinician, it kind of, it's, it's happening, we think automatically. Uh, just remember, go find your old notebooks from graduate school and start reading through. This is not automatic and this is not uh, common sense. These are things that we learned and we learned them and we um, scaffolded them and learned and learned and learned on top of each other to the point where we get mental representations. In that book, that uh, the smarter, faster, better, whatever the, the title was, they just talked about the, the nurse that was in the NICU, mm -hmm. that all these symptoms that were kind of taken independently weren't that big of a thing. Like it wasn't like that concerning in a lot of ways, but she had mental representation of like what these things could be and she was able to identify it very quickly. And actually the DSM-5 is a mental representation. Yeah. Yet when you start to ask questions and you start to focus in on symptoms, that's gonna populate like within your mind. If you're worried about say hypomania and the person says that they're, they're having no problem sleeping a solid eight hours a night, you already know this starts to die off a right. little bit. Yeah, this mental representation, like, that doesn't fit. That doesn't within. fit. So there might be, some, it sounds more like anxiety, for example. So then the question becomes, what would be the mental representation of a BHC that is trying to, from our sense, of like doing contextual and compassionate care? And this is where Access V uh, came from. Your brilliant way of kind of looking and putting these mental representations. Now, I would also say to the viewers, as we're going to go through Access V1, we have we have trainings about this. We have online recorded training, so you could definitely check out. I think it's four four hours worth. Four hours worth of it. <laughs> the second thing is is that Access V is definitely not complete. You know, I oh, mean, this no. is the first year of us even talking about Access V. So there's definitely going to be a lot of evolution, a lot of iterations to this. There already was. There already was, yeah. So let's talk through Access V. And we won't go into each point in uh, you know in depth, but we'll talk about it maybe a little bit to get people kind of understanding where we're going with Access V. What's the, what's the A? The A stands for ACEs. Okay. And so automatically having a really clear understanding exactly what the 10 original ones were, which ones are more, uh, they might not have been in the original Kaiser study, but they have the same feel to them where it's this pervasive, chronic state in which a person doesn't have agency and so once you kind of understand what are we getting at with the aces you can understand then why other things have been added to that can i pause you real quick because i think uh, my thing i messed up we skipped the step uh even oh. before the first thing is like this is where when we sometimes teach people to do the contextual interview it almost is a checklist. It's oh, almost used yeah, yeah. as kind of like a checklist. Like you can tell, it's like you're just asking living situation for living situation's sake. You're just asking about relationships and family. It literally, like, there's no, it's sometimes we even see it. I got to ask these questions and then we'll get into the actual thing. All the grace, love, compassion, compassion. For, for folks. But yeah, and it and probably means we just haven't explained it right or um, we hadn't have enough time. But yeah, I, you hear that a lot was like, um, I'm going to ask you all these questions and then we're going to get to the, and then you set them aside and now we're going to talk about the real problem. And it's like, no, the contextual interview, this is ever, this, this is everything. And the thing that always in grace and compassion to our trainees, who we <laughs> love, and again, they do an incredible job, such they incredible do. work. But sometimes when we're talking to them in supervision, we're asking them some of these questions like, who is this person? Like, tell me about them, you know? And you can tell there wasn't an, um, uh, I'm going to make up a word. I was going to say like a synthesizing. That's a word, right? Synthesize is a word. Yeah, synthesize. Synthesized view the of the person. There wasn't this connection with who this person was and what they were saying in the contextual interview. Synthesize is perfect. Perfect. Yeah, be, perfect. yeah who they are and what they're saying in the contextual interview, That this, this it, all that information is found right there. Exactly. And, and, the, and the reason why our mind says is because there isn't like these mental representations for when you're doing the contextual interview, what you are looking for. Right. What you are hearing for, what you're in your mind organizing the information to start to do. If I, and we can demonstrate it real quick for you in case you're like, well, what do you mean? Am I the one doing it? Am I the one asking questions? <laughs> and then just like, okay, well, now let's get to the real problem. So if I, if, if there was a 12 year old with behavior difficulties identified, and the very first question that you asked the 12 year old and their mom who was with them, who all lives in the house? And they say, well, my mom, uh, me, uh, and my little brother. Just thinking about, for you all watching that video and you heard that, 
What mental representations, like notice your mind like kicking off, like what mental representations are there? And even goes into like the ACEs kind of conversation that right now we even have some there's high some... probability that there's ACEs that are gonna be present within this. I think I took us on a completely different route, but you're probably trying to set up the contextual, or no, no. No, no, right? that was okay. great. No, okay. no, that, no, that was great. Cause again, immediately you're saying, hey, where's, where's Biodad? You know, that. That's the next question because it could, it, do, do we want to jump in the Access V then? Or did you have anything more to say about yeah, the Yeah, I, I do. The, the other thing that I was going to say, this mental representation and framework about Access V, I don't even know how to explain it. It almost like makes the contextual interview a living and breathing thing. Okay. That it allows the contextual interview to be so much more than a set of questions. When you have the members, mental representations of like what you're looking for in human beings, my mind says that sounds bad. I don't know if that sounds bad or not. But it's like when you have that, it amplifies the contextual interview. It makes it a living, breathing thing. Okay, let's yeah. go to Access V. Yeah. So, and we can use that small little case of behavior we can difficulty. Continue. Yeah. yeah, continue on. Throughout. Oh, the other thing I was going to say. Sorry if we continue. You're going you're to kill me. The other thing I was going to oh say. God. The um, The thing I loved was you said, say a 12-year-old gets referred for behavioral concerns. My first question is, Who's at home? Who are you living with? Because as us being functional contextualists, we're assuming the behavioral problems make they sense. They make sense. Our job is to find out what is prompting, what context is producing that. How so about that? In traditional way that we were trained in clinical psychology, in mental health counseling, clinical mental health counseling, our job isn't to find out why it makes sense. Our hmm. job is to identify a disorder and then treat the disorder. I reject that. Absolutely. Fra I mean, just Completely. flat out reject that. I like to think that I'm going into that room, I'm gonna figure out why this makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then if we can figure out why it makes sense, then maybe we can get some footing for what we can actually do about it. Beautiful, love it. Okay, okay. so 12-year-old, uh, behavioral concerns, go through the living situation, t hit on the uh, mom and sibling that yeah. was, was there. This is where the first A of ACEs come in. Yeah, so we were saying earlier, A stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And as we were saying, there's a list of the original 10. And then there's other ones that maybe weren't included in that, but have a similar flavor of chronic chronicity and um, where the person's agency is taken away from them, essentially. And uh, m knowing the, the research, this is another mental representation of once we get to four ACEs, the deleterious effects that it has on a person's, everyone knows mental health, mm. but physical health, the, the amount of um, health conditions a person can start experiencing once we hit four or more. And then just kind of knowing uh, which then it does bleed into some of these next ones on Access. Right, that's what I was just thinking. It does bring it into these next ones. Because we know that there's loss of agency. We know that there's um, a chronicity. We know that a person's in a chronic stress state in many cases. So, yeah, right off the bat, I want to know where, where where biological father is. What maybe caused biological if father? Because if he died, that's, it's, it's, that's an ace. If mom and dad had discord and they got divorced, that's an ace. And there's a huge difference between, you know, parents that may be separated amicably mm -hmm. and are co-parenting very well versus a contentious uh, separation. Versus one where the dad's not involved at all. And in in the tie, each one of them produces a slightly different context, all of which are important for us to start developing these mental representations as a clinician. Which goes into the next C of you know cultural uh, representations. And obviously cultural representation is this broad kind of category. You know, this could be specifically related to traditions and practices. This could be related to identity. This could be related to spirituality. All of these different cultural influences that we know can shape what is going, uh, how this person is interacting with their world. Yeah, you, ha you have, like you said, the full spectrum of like, in some cases it's, uh, and this isn't only just thinking of negatives. Uh, uh, absolutely. We're also, absolutely. We're also um, mining for strengths. Yes. Uh, too, so especially with well the cultural said. one. Yes. So if you know that somebody is a minoritized individual and maybe they're living in an area where there's a majority culture, hmm. uh, that's like a really big majority and they're very, you know, maybe a smaller population, we know that they could be at risk mm. 
for like when a, when the kiddo goes to school of kind of feeling like maybe like an outsider of some sort 100%. or maybe either systemic or like um, structural uh, racism and discrimination, or it could be overt. We're, we're not quite sure. And I mean, if you think about the flip as well, say this 12 year old is coming from my minority culture and they are now maybe assimilating more because of school into this majority culture. What's that doing to the family when they come home and maybe there's certain traditions and certain expectations. What is that producing there could, within that individual? There could be a, a, an entire host. And then there's, like we said, also all the strengths yes. here. And knowing, you know, what, where can you get, again, um, footholds. Connection, val uh, 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 values and mission and what really drives and purpose within. All these positive aspects that we know can be very healing, can be very supportive and produce a lot of incredible things. And very individualized. I mean, you know, depending on whoever it is that's sitting in front of us, getting to know them as a person and seeing them. We say that all the time from Avatar, like I see you. Being able to see somebody for who they are, I mean, we, we, we can't extract. So that's a very important part. Which goes into uh, the next C, which is the contextual internal context that they have. So uh, context internal. And the two questions that we've done, uh, I think either a snippet or a corner about this already, about the internal context, which is you know asking those two questions, how does this person see themselves and how does this person see their world? Which are always gonna be shaped by, as we said, maybe aces, cultural, kind of things that are going on around them, whatever it is. How does this person see themselves and see their world? So let's just imagine that that example that we gave where we have the 12 year old um, and let's say he, we'll just call him he, is uh, coming in for behavioral difficulties is with his mom and his little brother and we find out uh, that his mom and dad had a really contentious relationship and they divorced at age four when he was four mm. and the dad has actually not been in his life mm. Uh, since he was four and then when he goes to school he gets into a lot of trouble mm. we could already start imagining is is this a, a kid who feels really good about himself right that he feels very secure can he predict what is going to happen in his world i mean these are questions is, we're not saying that, that correct uh, this is what to be curious about these are the mental representations because again if you're able to predict your world there's a whole slew of almost like thriving behaviors that can come from that if your world is unpredictable and chaotic and harmful, that produces a whole slew of different behavioral responses and repertoire. I mean, maybe he was starting school right when the dad, you know, eventually when mom and dad finally divorced, maybe there was still some contact. And then when the dad finally went away, that could have been right when he was starting school. Mm -hmm. And then he maybe he wasn't able to concentrate. And we all know that if you miss those first few years mm -hmm. of concentration, you're not able, then Then you kind of get lost in the mid. I mean, I, I, we're going down some rabbit holes, but I mean, these are things this to, is the point, to think about. And Correct. you're doing this in real, I, now again, nobody panic. Right. As a uh, experienced clinician, you are holding all of this in your mind. Allowing almost the, in the moment. mental representations to be ignited. Correct. For allowing like what the person is saying is to ignite these things to start coming up. Like Correct. aces, cultural, contextual, uh, the context internal, and then external context, which is the E of the axis, which is basically just, like, again, what are the influences surrounding this individual? You know, social relationships, both positive and negative, the quality, the, I almost like combining the words there, the quality, the quality and quantity. the quantity of it. What, what are these things that are influencing them? Because we know, um, now external context is much more than just social relationships, but we know how important social relationships are to human development, uh, to people thriving, and then also potential being harmed you know it's a really big thing so that goes to the e and that love work play uh that will that will feed you the external context which goes into i'm sure this is where you're going as well so it's not just about asking you know hey you, you know do you have friends yes okay we're moving on you know right, that it's doesn't... not just asking you know who's your family and then people being left out it's like we need to know what's causing this person's family to be left out in the connections that they because yeah, you're building that picture of what's it like to be living in this person's skin. Absolutely. So the next, uh, so we have uh, ACEs, cultural, context internal, context external for the E, and then we have uh, social determinants of health. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's as, I, th I think, as fundamental as ACEs. Hmm. No doubt. I, I mean, you're going to be listening. I mean, even in that living situation, like, 
are we renting? Mm-hmm. Is it is it stable? Mm-hmm. I mean, how many folks are we working with where they were renting from a, a person and then that person had to sell the house for various mm-hmm. reasons or wanted to sell the house for various reasons and it leaves them displaced, especially in the current context of uh, inflation and, and, and prices rising. Yeah. And, that, and, and so understand that social determinant of like, what must it be like for a family where they were living maybe in the same place for six years and now they don't have the finances to move to somewhere safe or somewhere at all. So say that, that, that mom and that 12-year-old were thinking, hey, you know what would be really great if they like, did walks together at, at night. <laughs> Is it a safe neighborhood to walk in? Is there a walking path for you to be able to access these social determinants of health things that are or key to influencing the work that we if do? If they have to move in with a family member. Correct. And we're over there giving it, you know, it just, it just gets me like kind of emotional. It's like we just walk in as the experts diagnosing the problem and then start giving the interventions. I mean, how invalidating is that? It's like, do you think that person, that people haven't thought about some of this stuff? <laughs> like, It goes into very nicely... The next S. That does. This is a beautiful segue. Which it's is? Stage of change. Yeah. I think anybody working in integrated care should have uh, ex- extensive training in motivational interviewing. And motivational interviewing is a style. Hmm. You can have it combined with your conceptual, your theor- uh, therapeutic orientation. There we yeah. go. Uh, I don't know. I, I was going to combine some words again. But therapeutic. I'll tell you what. Just splice them together. <laughs> <That's> what- <laughs> Yeah, just splice them together. Nobody will know the difference. But you, you can have that combined. So although I operate from an acceptance and commitment therapy, internal mm-hmm. conceptualization lens, you better believe I'm using motivational interviewing style oh, yeah. and, and so many of the core concepts that are coming from it. And stage of change, I mean, again, you have to, there's like understanding the social determinants and seeing that person is one thing that does filter into the stage of change. There's some folks that are in very stable situations, maybe not that situation, mm-hmm. that's also more are in a pre-contemplative because maybe whatever, and, and here's the thing, instead of it being like, oh, well, they're in the pre-contemplative, that's so bad, that's so something or other, and I'm gonna be like internally judgmental of it. I'm not saying I never get judgmental, we're human. Um, but really try to stay away from that and move more into, if, if somebody's not ready to change yet, mm-hmm. it could be because what's it's kind of working for them right now or the prospect of changing is such an arduous road and i mean wouldn't we be better off knowing that and that's where my mind was going for this because we almost use stages of change almost it's like a i know label. we did and like no, no, well, i don't think we, the field i think has used stage of change as almost like a label and it's something that's like punitive. i know i feel like i said that right off the bat i don't think you did okay uh, yeah well, i don't think you were good. describing it that way um you know we, who knows but I, I don't think you were i think and maybe because i know what you well, maybe what saying. i mean <laughs> but the the stage of change is like it's not just what is the stage of change it's why it's like why How, and again it, why does this make sense why does this make sense for this person to be in this stage of change you know it's that curiosity of just not just trying to figure out because that's the way we almost teach the stage of change right but find out what stage of change right and then intervene to get them to the next stage and it's like no it's like why would meet, it make sense for this person to be meet in this stage them of where they are in that pre-contemplative stage and here's the, here's the kicker sometimes you can move somebody to move somebody to even those words. Sometimes you can go on a we journey with, alongside of somebody where they they move from pre-contemplative to contemplative. Absolutely. Sometimes you meet with them and they're in, still in pre-contemplative and you're like, all right, well, that makes sense why they're in pre-contemplative. And your role as a BHC is to go out and tell the physician hey. or the medical team why this is working for them and why the change just doesn't make sense. The change, how about that for language? This is why this change doesn't make sense for them right now versus this person, well, they're in the pre-contemplative. We'll see what we can do. Maybe at some point we'll move them to contemplative. And could you imagine, right, if we start to change some of the focus on the context, right? This goes back to the contextual interview, you knowing all these different things. Like what if we shifted some of these contextual variables that might increase the stage of change within this person, to right? Where- it actually it makes, makes sense. That you don't even talk about it because it just actually naturally happens. We always talk about this with smoking, you know, with people might be in plea contemplative or contemplative. It's like, uh, you know, probably a good chance that social support might not be there for if we focus on social support connection and getting them through, maybe just naturally their stage of change improves. So that goes to the last part of this, the V. Values. Values. Stated simply, I mean, you could find values uh, in all kinds of uh different therapeutic orientations Mm. throughout the psychological literature. I think the easiest definition for my brain that I've seen is what's important to the patient. What drives them? What drives them? Purpose, meaning. 
what do they feel connected yes with where when are they living a life that feels congruent in their skin and in their being and um really finding out what that is and they tell i mean when you do a contextual back to the thing the right. contextual interview you're not okay let me check 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 okay now we got those out of the way now let me talk to you it's like with every single answer every question that you ask every answer that they have from the very very beginning is you're going to be filtering and you're going to be listening for values and again love grace compassion but i've seen a lot of BHCs where you do your contextual interview and then you get to the end and you say, ask the patient what their values are. Correct. That in and of itself is not wrong. In fact, it's not necessarily a bad idea to check in on them. In my personal and professional opinion, I think that you're a lot better off listening for them and then saying, okay, so what I hear you saying are the things that are most important to you are your family, your relationship, your career, and your education. Do I have that right? Is there any of these ones that I'm missing? And it relates to them almost what you were saying with Avatar. I see you. Like, I see you for who you are right now. As I'm listening and gathering this information, and I'm hearing these values, I'm able to reflect them back to them because I see you. And I'm here with you right now. It's not an intervention. It's not like a, you know, we can define it that way. It's more about a human connection that we're discussing. And this is why I always love when Stephen Hayes even talks about ACT. And he gets excited when ACT gets lumped in the humanistic right. uh, uh, kind of philosophies. That it's like a human connection that's driving this. So as we look at this, that's ACCESS-V. Yeah. ACES. Cultural. Contextual. Internal. Contextual. External. Stage of change social determinants of health and values yeah and that framework replaces symptomology correct it replaces a dsm-5 it amplifies the contextual interview and the thing that i also love and check out the trainings if you want more about this is how you phrased it is that we then take the ci to produce access v and then we filter right. evidence-based medicine through through their access v to actually produce something meaningful, human, contextual, and compassionate that we're going to work with the human on. And just to clarify, uh, when I say replace uh, the DSM, I mean with that, uh, like we were saying in the, in the very beginning of the video, where it's like the goal is you meet the patient, you do a diagnostic mm -hmm. evaluation, we get the diagnosis, and the diagnosis informs the treatment plan. Instead, you, you meet the patient, you do the contextual interview to get to know them. You have access V is what you're um, creating in your mind. Those are the me mental representations mm -hmm. that are being uh, ignited. And then, like you said, we're then filtering through the evidence-based um, interventions through that. And, and actually, the DSM um, and knowing the, knowing the uh, different conditions that have been categorized that way for communication purposes, which is why we originally did the diagnosing, was for communication purposes. Yep. Uh, to be able to look at the research, I actually think is a mental representation. Couldn't I think it more. is good to know that this cluster of symptoms we call depression, for the cluster of symptoms that we call depression, here are some really important interventions. So we can go and uh, hear about a person's context, their situation, and then it's sound, the symptoms, symptomology fits depression. So we then know in our brain another mental representation gets activated is we know behavior activation could be helpful. We know social support could be helpful. So you're not, I'm not saying that it's not useful to know something. I'm not saying it's not useful to have not some level of communication. But relying on, like, I don't know what to do with this patient unless I have a diagnosis, we're getting rid of all of that. You know where my mind goes, and this is such a, you know, aspirational. It's not even aspirational because it's not going to ever happen. It's in the universe. Can you imagine if we were able to bill via yeah. Access B? Yeah. Could you imagine if this is what allowed us to actually, like, drove what we did? How cool right? would it be, like, you did a values inventory? So the diagnosis... Uh, what you not build the diagnosis, under. but you what, build what, under. What you build under. See, that's how entrenched right. it is. But yeah, what you build under was values clarification. You're you telling me that's not important? What you build on was social determinants of health. What you build on, under was some form of discrimination that was going on within this person's life that caused them not to access the healthcare system. And we're trying to think about that. That's where. So that okay. is what I uh, hope you enjoyed this again. Uh, Access V, re not replacing the DSM-5, but... Giving us structure if you want to do a contextual and compassionate uh, BHC visit. Mental representations that this allows to ignite and really amplifies the CI. Cool. Thanks for stopping by.